You're listening to episode 116 of Financial So you can do the things you're called to do. That's to build generational wealth and leave an inheritance for your children's children. I'm your host, Lynn Demons. That's Demons, no demons here. D-E-M-M-O-N-S. We want to share with you guys the guiding principle for our show, which is Matthew 6 and 33. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. We also implore that you pray over your finances so you can do the things that you're called to do. So if you will, bow with me. Lord, help us to value the things in this world that are really valuable. That's our relationship with you, our lives, and our families. Help make us responsible stewards of your financial resources. And let us trust your holy word. Eternal glory, in thy son Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, guys, we're Super excited to have a special guest in the podcasting studio with us today. Go get your pen and your paper so that you can get the juicy nuggets that we're about to drop. But before you do that, make sure you share your money success stories with us. Give us a call, 470-236-8282. Let us know how you're doing. Are you making your money, keeping your money, and growing your money? All right, now to our special guest. Guys, you don't want to miss this. We have in the podcasting studio with us today, Mr. Dave Lowell. Dave, how are you? I'm doing so good. How are you doing? I am well. We thank you so much for having this courageous conversation with us today um, and sharing with us. But before we get started, why don't you introduce yourself to our audience? Awesome. Yeah. So thanks for having me on. I'm, I'm so happy to be here. Um, but yeah, my name is Dave Lowell. I am a financial coach. I'm a certified financial planner. So I help people understand when they make the money, I help them understand how to grow it and how to leave it on to future generations like you talked about. So there's a lot of moving pieces. We just help make it as efficient as possible um, so that you know, we can really accomplish our, our life goals you know, and using our money to do it. So that's what I do. Awesome. Awesome. So Dave, let's get to the juicy part. We want to think about um, when you were a child, what was your relationship with money when you were growing up? And was there someone in your family who influenced that? Definitely. Um, My parents were both very, uh, they were very frugal. Uh, They're very responsible with their money. Uh, they did not spend excessively almost ever. And so I learned from a really young age that if I wanted something, I had to earn the money to get it for myself. And one of those, one of those times was, you know, Nintendo 64 was, was big when I was a kid, right? And uh, my friend had one, he was going to sell it. And so I did all types of work I could to save up the money and I bought it from him. And that was like my first like kind of realization where I worked hard, I got the money and then I got what I wanted. Um, but yeah, mm-hmm. hard work it was, uh, was instilled in me from very young. Wow, how intuitive of you, right? To go ahead and do the work to get the Nintendo 64, yes, yes. Um, and, and I'm very, uh, very familiar with that because my little one, he's into the Nintendo Switch ge- yeah, era now, but he always asks me, he's like, mom, <laughs> he's like, mom, did you do the old school Nintendo? <laughs> I was like, really, buddy? <laughs> so yes, yes. Awesome. 
Awesome. So thinking back, um, what was your first job? Did you have a job to get the Nintendo or how did you work that? Well, that at that point, I was probably 12 years old or so. And so I did, you know, extra chores around the house, right? I would negotiate with my parents. Hey, if I do this extra thing above and beyond my normal chores that I just had to do to live in the house. Mm -hmm. But any extra things I'd negotiate and do that. Um, I actually started with my older brother, a window washing company. And so we would go, my grandma lived in like this condominium complex for older individuals. Um, and so she would tell all her friends and we would go and visit all the 70 and 80 year old ladies and wash their windows. And they were just the sweetest, but you know, it's just, it was just more like being creative to figure out, okay, how can I, how can I make money? even if I'm young, you know, not using that as an excuse to just sit around and wait till I was 16. Right, right. So what did you do with that first paycheck working with your brother? <laughs> <laughs> oh, man, I think, uh, I think the first one, we actually, if I remember correctly, my dad helped us buy, you know, the squeegees and the buckets and things like that initially. So I'm pretty sure the first paycheck, we kind of had to pay him back for, for those. <laughs> and then, and then, um, and then I think I just started saving for my Nintendo 64, to be honest. Like I had very, I was very one track mind. I wanted Mario Kart and Super Smash Brothers. So I was, I was determined to get there, you know? <laughs> right, right. Awesome. Awesome. So in, that's, that's funny. I, um, you're, you're the first, <laughs> You're the first window washer um, owning your own business uh, on the show. So there we that's go. <laughs> <laughs> awesome, awesome. So in looking through, um, let's fast forward to today. How did you get into this line of work coming from the starting your own business, right, at that very young age to where you are today? What did that path look like for you? I think... I think a, a large part of it, like I said, my parents were really responsible and they set us up with a, with a good life, you know, nothing extravagant, but we were taken care of. And, um, you know, except for maybe really early on, we never were in want of the necessities. And mm -hmm. so I owe a huge debt of gratitude to them um, for, you know, providing that type of upbringing. And, but, but I never thought, even if I had that business, the window washing, right? I always just thought I would get a job and, you know, just, I never really wanted a lot of money. It, it just never occurred to me that I could get a lot. And so it wasn't like in my mind, um, but I had a mentor. I, I got a sales job after, um, you know, when I was in my first year in college or so, and I got a sales job door to door selling pest control. And it's really hard work but the commissions are big, right? right. Because you, they got to pay somebody to go out there and knock doors, <laughs> right? And my boss at the time, he had been successful. He started and built several companies and sold them. And he was the one that kind of put it in my mind that there is more out there. Like I can achieve more. And if I have what, what's good in my heart, I love the scripture you talked about first, right? Seek ye first the kingdom of God. It's very similar principle, right? That if I have the right desires in my heart and I want to do good in the world, then, then the Lord will bless me with the means to make that happen. And the more that I have, the more good that my, you know, my family can do for others. And he's kind of the one that really planted that seed and started me on the journey of, okay, how can I then, how can I do something that's maybe more impactful that extends beyond my immediate family and maybe ripples out to help other people. Uh, and that started my journey of just trying to figure out what this money thing was, how to earn it, how to manage it, how to grow it. And I just, it just kind of started me on that journey. And, and um, so I ended up in this industry, right? Finance investments. Mm -hmm. It's a very natural uh, process for me to come into this field. Awesome, awesome. So I love that you shared um, the way that it grows for outside of your family, not just 
meeting your immediate need, but also being able to benefit the greater community, if you will. Mm -hmm. um, so in looking at that, and, and that definitely ties into our concept here, building generational wealth, right? Yeah. And leaving inheritance for your children's children. So, and it's amazing how a sales job is the job that kicks you over, <laughs> right? <laughs> is that mindset from that salesperson, because it takes a very different level of mindset to be a salesperson, to go knock on someone's door mm -hmm. and to sell pest control. That's a very different mindset, right? <laughs> that you have to <laughs> yeah. acquire in order to be successful. So in thinking about that then, so how does the mindset now plays in, into the financial realm of what you do as a financial coach? How important is that? It's so big. Um, like I said, that, that one boss that I had, the owner of that company, he really allowed me to see that, that I could get more not just for the sake of having more, but, but that there was more potential than I thought of before. And I, again, I'd always grown up just planning to live a comfortable life and not really thinking beyond that. But he was the one that helped change my mindset and kind of instill that desire. And so what I find now as I work with clients or as I, as I teach classes or whatever, <clears throat> What I find is that those beliefs that we have about money or a relationship with money that, that we have growing up, right? If we, if we think back, Lynn, okay, I, I wanna take you back now, right? You think back to how you grew up, right? And your first, your first experience when you were kind of conscious of money, right? Um, maybe, maybe you earned some, maybe there wasn't enough money for something. Whatever that first experience was and what it taught you, that really does hang around and it's reinforced throughout those, those early years. And, and a lot of us have some good perceptions of money, but most of us have some very negative perceptions of money that actually kind of form a glass ceiling. And we self-sabotage, there's a lot of research about this, but we self-sabotage to stay mm -hmm. below that glass ceiling to in the zone where we're comfortable and we don't have to stretch ourselves. And a lot of that's due to those, you know, those subconscious beliefs that we have. And so I do a lot of that work with people first and foremost, before we look at numbers, we have to really understand what you, how you feel about money, your relationship with money, and then understanding if you want to keep those or if you want to change them based on what your future wants to look like. Yes, I, I love it. So I have a friend um, who you remind, remind me of in that conversation. And one of the things that he said, you have to get rid of the negative BS. He said, get rid of the negative belief system that you have so that you can now, you know, move to the next level, move to the positive side of things so you can actually make those changes mm -hmm. that are inherent for us as far as that glass ceiling that you mentioned, right? Mm -hmm. How do we get beyond that ceiling? Because whatever success we have realized with money we're blocking ourselves from going above it because of that success we've now realized. Right. So how do we make our, get our minds to, to move to that next level? Awesome. Awesome. So in, I'm sorry, did you want to say something? <laughs> well, I was just, yeah, I was just going to say like, uh, let, let's look at just a few common beliefs about money and see how they can be good and also bad depending on our situation. Okay. So, right. so one common one would be, um, money doesn't bring happiness. Right. right. You hear that all the time. Okay. So from one standpoint, it could be good, right? Because if you're having a really tough economic time and you're going through a tough time, it's nice because you can find happiness in other things, right? Mm -hmm. So in your relationships, in the work that you do, you can find fulfillment and things like that. So it can be good and help you through really hard times financially. On the flip side, um, money can bring a good measure of happiness, right? Oh, yes, it can. <laughs> you know, like Absolutely. a lot. <laughs> the things that we buy, maybe not so much, but the experiences that we're able to have, whether that's taking yeah. that vacation with your family without stressing about, you know, it's on my credit card, like knowing that you've saved and planned 
and you can go on that amazing vacation and spend that time with your family, that's priceless. And that really does bring happiness. Yeah. Or having the money to be able to go out and give it to somebody that needs it and still feel okay because you're taken care of, right? You're not, you're not putting yourself in jeopardy to help somebody else. So again, that belief can be good. It can also be bad and kind of hold us back and be an excuse to not improve our skills and get a higher income or an excuse to not start saving and growing our wealth and in investments because we don't need it to be happy. So that, that's just one example of, of how maybe a good belief can actually hold us back to some extent. Does that make, does that make sense? Yes, absolutely. Yes, yes. So, and you bring up a valid point because oftentimes in the Christian church, you are brought up to believe, right? That, well, there's a scripture, the love of money, right? Is the root of, money is the root of all evil. When in actuality, that's not what it is. Right. So a lot of people mix that love of money and that happiness, they mix that up, right? We get it mm -hmm. intertwined within our belief system. So I'm glad that you brought that up because it's very important to see, yeah, there's good and bad to everything, but money absolutely can bring happiness in the way that you shared, in those experiences, in the yeah. opportunities that it allows you to be able to take a part of or the philanthropic opportunities that you're now able to be able to give to someone else and your family still able to, to survive, to thrive, you know, exactly. in yeah, that I mean, realm. You look back and, you know, you look back in any of the scriptures, right? Mm -hmm. And when people live righteously, the Lord blessed them and prospered them, right? Like you see that language all the time. And what, it, what do you think that means? <laughs> right, right, right like exactly. They were economically prosperous uh, as well as mm -hmm. other areas in their life. So it's not, yeah, like you said, that if, if, you, if you put the love of money or acquisition of money or wealth before all else, that's bad. Obviously, yeah. that's bad. But, um, but the Lord does want to bless us. Bottom line. Yeah. He wants, he's looking for excuses to do it. Right. And right. So, <laughs> and so as, as we do it, right. As we ha put him first and as we, and as we work for it, he is going to bless us with means to take care of ourselves and, and to help others. So it's, it, it, you know, scripturally, there's very good doctrine around, um, around the Lord wanting us to have more economic means. Yes, yes. And I love that you made the valid point that he's looking for excuses to be able to get it to us. And what it turns out to be is that we're blocking it ourselves. <laughs> he's right. looking for a way for us. To, he says, I've come that you may have life and have it more abundantly. Mm -hmm. That's in all areas of life. And yep. looking for excuses for us to get it. People, I need you to catch that. He's looking for an excuse for you to have what he says you can have. But we're standing in our own way oftentimes, and we're not able to get to that point. Awesome. Thank you for sharing that. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. That, that, hit, that touched the nerve. That touched the nerve for me. Well, I so, believe let, it. I believe it. It's, it's guided me, right? It's guided me in my pursuits yeah, yeah. because I don't want to tip over the edge where I'm, I'm just pursuing wealth to pursue wealth. I don't want to go there. And so it's, right. it's, it's on my mind. I want to do it for the right reasons, right? Absolutely, absolutely. So as you are working and you're working with different clients, um, are there any misconceptions that stand out um, with the different clients that you support or that you work with? Yeah, definitely. And I think, I think the fact that a lot of what determines our economic outcome is, is our beliefs around money. Um, mm -hmm. So, so Daniel Kahneman, he was a, a world renowned psychologist and economist, and he won the Nobel prize in economics in 2002 for his research, where he found that when we make a financial decision, 90% of that decision is based in emotion and only 10% of mm -hmm. that is based in logic. And so here in America, especially, right, we, we look around, we see the situation we're in. America, the vast majority of people are not in a great situation financially. 
right? So you just look at the numbers. Yeah. It doesn't look good. Yeah. That doesn't mean we don't know that we should be saving money or we don't know that we shouldn't be racking up huge credit card bills or, or whatever. We do generally know those things. We just don't do them. Mm. And so, and so more important before you look at the actual math of the situation, right? The dollars and cents and putting it here and there is really, really important to become aware of those beliefs that we have about money right now and also get clear about the future. So there's a lot of mindset uh, for me, emotional and spiritual work to really get in the right frame of mind. When all of that's clear, all of a sudden your behaviors follow suit. All of a sudden you start saving like you should, you stop spending like you shouldn't. And it's amazing how quickly things align when things are aligned in your mind and in your heart. And I think that's, that's a huge misconception that people have. They think it's all about the dollars and cents and it's just not. Mm -hmm. So you bring up another valid point here too. And, and looking at that um, misconception around a mindset. And I love too, to add to that point, Tony Robbins tells us that success leaves clues, right? Mm -hmm. And yeah. if success leaves clues, then that means that there's a path that we need to take in order to get from point A to point B, <laughs> right? Yeah, and in understanding that there is a, a, a path, a path to saving, a path to investing, a path, a path for spending, right? We have to recognize what that is for us, but that there are some direct steps that we, we should be able to take that are going to be able to get us to our why, if you will. Mm -hmm. uh, so in looking at that misconception around um, your beliefs around money and the money mindset, um, I love, what was the uh, researcher's name you gave in the beginning? The 90% emotion, 10% logic. What was his name again? His, his name is Daniel Kahneman. He's a, uh, yeah. Daniel Kahneman. Daniel Kahneman. All right. Awesome. Awesome. Because we hear that statistic all the time, but I've never uh, connected the name to it. Daniel mm -hmm. Kahneman. All right. Good, good, good. All right. So moving right along, if we think about, um, for example, let's say client Lynn, I come into your office and I want to work with you. What does that look like? Um, how do you help me to now develop the right mindset? What's the process um, that we go through? Yeah. So it's, that's such a good question. And it's, 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 it's kind of a process that I've developed over time as I did advise, right? I was in investment management for, for a number of years and it was so focused on dollars and cents. And we could tell people, you know, give them certain bits of advice that mm -hmm. was clearly better. Like we showed them, this is the best decision for you and they still wouldn't do it. And I would just scratch my head thinking, what in the world? Like this is day and night and they wouldn't. And so that started me thinking about, okay, well, money's emotional, money's emotional. There's more to it. And so when I work with a client, first thing we do is we have to get really clear on what the current situation is. So we do look at the dollars and cents, right? What's your income? What are your expenses? What are your assets, right? Do you have a little bit of money here and a little bit there? What do you have? What's your debt situation? We get crystal clear on the actual numbers. Okay. That alone helps people start to think differently about your money. So, if, right. you know, people listening to this, if you want to take anything away, here's some very practical things, right? Just get it all down on paper or a spreadsheet or something and look at it and just think about it <laughs> for a minute. So once I, once we understand the current state of, you know, state of the union for, you know, to say it like that, right. The state of our money, then we think, okay, why is it this way? And that's when we go back and I take them through a number of exercises to understand what were those beliefs around money? What did you learn from your parents or your peers about money? How was that relationship? And how has that shaped where you are today? Because something in the past has gotten you to where you are now. What is it? So we discover that. Once we've discovered that, then we look future, into the future and say, what is the life that you want to create? Not the one you think you can create or the one that seems possible, 
But if, if you're honest with yourself, what is the actual life you want for your family? And get really, really, really clear about that. And there's, again, there's a number of exercises to take through that. Make sure your life is aligned with your values and your faith and everything. But so once we understand where we are, where we were, where we want to go, then we start putting the math and the pieces together to build those stones to create that future. We, we reprogram our beliefs about money to make that future a possibility instead of a pipe dream. Hmm. And then we just hmm. step by step, right? We take the, with our money, we implement the plan to, to get there. Good. Possibilities instead of pipe dreams <laughs> like that. So in looking at that and what I heard you say was, it's very important to do an analysis of where you are currently. Hmm. So listeners, if there's not, if you have not taken that initial step, where are you currently? Put it down on paper because we all know without the vision, the people perish. You have no vision if it's not written, right? So how do you get that on paper? You put it down. You take, you make an analysis of everything as he shared with you. Good. Then you can take those formidable steps, right, to get to your next level. Awesome, Dave. So um, in looking at the whole picture and everything that you've shared with us today, are there any parting words before we end our broadcast? Any last words you would like to leave with the audience? Well, I, yeah. And again, I thank you so much for having me on. I've, I've had a really fun conversation with you, Lynn, and, and I hope your, your listeners get some value out of this. Um, uh, one, one thing I'll share, and I haven't really shared this with very many people. It's something I hold really close to the chest. Uh, but, I, but I hope it helps, again, adjust that kind of perception and that reality. Um, and it just has to do with faith in general. Um, as much as we need to have faith in the Lord, he wants us to have faith in ourselves and in our mm -hmm. ability and our potential. And, and so a lot of what guides my decisions I make sure they're aligned with what he wants for me. But then you have to take steps into the darkness and, right. and rely on your faith in your future vision, what you, what you think he wants you to become. And it's very uncomfortable to do it, right? Like, it's just like at night without a flashlight and you're camping or something and walking around is super right. uncomfortable in the darkness. But that's what we have to do in every aspect of life to an extent, mm -hmm. but it's the same way with our money. You're, you're gonna realize you're gonna be a little bit uncomfortable, but you just have to take the step with faith. And then you just take the next step, just one at a time. And small and through small and simple things, great things are brought to pass, okay? And just one little step at a time, all of a sudden you'll look back and you'll say, wow, how far did I come? I had no idea I would come this far, but you just have to go forward with faith. So that's, that's, I think of my parting words that I'd leave. Awesome. I love it. And those parting words remind me of a song we used to sing as kids. Lord, if you, if I make one step, you'll make two. So he'll help you to get through it. If you just step, like he said earlier, guys, he's looking for excuses to help us to get there. We just need to make sure we're aligned and we take the steps. Thank you, Dave. I love it. <laughs> I love it. We appreciate you for stopping by and dropping those nuggets for us here with Financial Confidence. Guys, I'm Lynn Demons. That's Demons, no demons here. Before we go, Dave, how do we find you? How do they find you on social media or connect with you if they want to follow you? Yeah, absolutely. So I'm on LinkedIn all the time. Uh, but every social media platform, I'm the Dave Lowell. So Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, at the Dave Lowell, you can find me. All right. That you heard it here first, guys, at the Dave Lowell. All right, guys. Thank you so much for tuning in for Financial Confidence, where we're helping you to make your money, keep your money, and grow your money so you can do the things that you're called to do. That's to build generational wealth and leave an inheritance for your children's children. We thank you so much for tuning in. Don't forget to like and subscribe. Oh, yeah. By the way, we have some freebies for you. Don't forget to text to that number, 312-487-3550. Podcast FC is the keyword. Get the freebies to help support you on your financial journey. 
We thank you so much for tuning in, and we'll see you again next week at the same time. Until then, you guys stay safe.